Well, hello, Wednesday night saints. We're here for our continued study in the book of Nehemiah. We're surveying how to rebuild a broken culture because that's exactly what he was about. And that's really what we need to be about. If Christ be not come, we need to affect the conditions of our community in which we live, which we work, and in which we worship. And we want to do that as a church, and we want to encourage you to be part of rebuilding a broken society. We ended last time with chapter 7. I want to make one quick note about chapter 7. Please notice how many times it said throughout the chapter, the sons of, the sons of, the sons of. And that is because developing men is absolutely critical if you want a society to function well. Obviously, women are absolutely strategic. But the enemy goes over time to get rid of men so that the fathers are not there. Fathers-to-be are not trained. So that single parents have the added work of providing and parenting. And in so many of our communities, men are missing spiritually or physically or emotionally. And as a result of that, the impact is felt negatively. So please notice that he wanted to rebuild, but he needed the sons of, the sons of, the sons of, because they needed the impact of their fathers for the well-being of the society. Now, chapter 8 is one of the great chapters in the Bible of revival. It is a chapter where people are being soaked in the word of God. It says the people gathered in verse 1. As one man, they were unified in the square and they asked Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given Israel. They said, bring the word of God back out. Why? Because it was their departure from the word that got them in this predicament in the first place. And the more we depart from God and his precepts and his standards and our commitment to him, the more decay, decay we will experience. So Ezra brought the law, he brought the law out, and he read from it, verse 3, in the square, and in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So everybody who had the cognitive ability to hear and understand the word of God were gathered. Why? Because the word of God needed to infiltrate the lives of the people. He made a wooden podium in verse 4. That's where you get a pulpit from, okay, uh, which had been made for this purpose. So you get pulpits, podiums to elevate so that the word of God can be articulated. He opens the book in verse 5 and all the people stood up. So now you see where asking people to stand for the reading of the word comes from. That was to pay homage and honor to the word of God. He blesses the, the Lord in verse 6. And the people said, here it is, amen, amen, so be it. It's a word of agreement. While lifting up their hands, they bowed low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hands up, ready to receive, head down in humble consecration before the Lord. Verse 8 says, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they could understand the reading. This is what biblical exposition is designed to do. It is designed to read the word, explain the meaning of the word that you've read so that you know what to do in light of what you've learned from the word so it can be activated in your life and in this, case, in this context in a whole society. Verse 9 is a very interesting verse because we see at the end of verse 9 it says, the day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for the people were weeping when they heard the word, words of the law. He had to tell them in verse 10, do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. He says in verse 11, do not be grieved. The, the folks are very sad, heartbroken, disturbed and distressed. Why? Because when they departed from the word of God, 
And for all of these years, the culture had collapsed. If they would not have had to depart, if they did not depart from the word of God, they wouldn't be in this social, spiritual, uh, economic, uh, physical condition that society had decayed to. When we wander from God's standard, whether it's personal, family, church, or societal, then decay sets in. It broke their hearts to hear that they didn't have to be in this situation. Maybe some of you know what it is to have your heart broken that if I hadn't wandered from God, I wouldn't be in the predicament that I'm, I'm in. So they were sad. They were regretful that they had wandered from God. But isn't it good news to know that God can meet us in our distress about our past mistakes? He says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. How do you get strength when you're discouraged? When you look around, all that's happening in our world today, it can be a little bit discouraging, can it? But how do you get strength when you see that our departure from God is really the, the nexus, it's really the, the basis of all this catastrophic activity? Well, you have to get the joy of the Lord. Now, whose joy is it? It's the Lord's joy. So what we want to do is borrow some joy, right? You want to borrow some joy from the Lord. So your return to the Lord gives you access to the joy of the Lord and the joy of the Lord can override the pain of the past. Now you can, you can treat the past like a, 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 a rear view mirror or you can treat it like a windshield. You need to learn from it, you need to grow from it, but you can't live in it, not if you want a better tomorrow. So pursue the Lord's joy that you get to share in which will quell the grief of your regrets. So, Notice verse 13, the heads of the father's households of all the people began the process of helping people to gain understanding in the words of the law. So here we have the men again, accepting their spiritual responsibility for their families. The men took responsibility for making God's word known to their families. Isn't that what we're missing today? Spiritual leadership in the home. Because if you're going to have a solid culture, you need to have a spiritual foundation. And that is the man's responsibility in leading the home. Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's biblical headship. Biblical headship is not walking around talking about I'm the head of the house. I'm the king of the house. I'm, oh, no, no, that's, that's, that's talking noise. The question is, are you providing spiritual leadership? Okay. Ezra the priest was given the information, they were to take that information and rehearse it with their families. That's why men should be leading and going to church. To hear what's said from the pulpit, extract principles from it that you rehearse with your family. Okay, not just to go hear it, but to utilize what you've heard to rehearse with your family if you want to build a solid foundation for society. Verse 16, the people went out and made booths for themselves. Well, this is what the law prescribed. These booths were to remind them of how God provided for them during the wilderness. That even during the dark days of uh, when they were destitute, back, back in the old days, they were reminded about how God provided. You know, we're living in a day when so many of us have progressed far from where our ancestors were. And yet their faith in God got them through. Our faith in God is getting us nowhere because we don't remember that it was their spiritual connection that was the foundation of their survival. We have more money, more credit cards, more cars, more houses, more notoriety, more technology, and more miserable, okay? More decay, more unraveling because we've departed from remembering. They went back to remembering through this process. And verse 18 says, and on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. That's a sacred gathering, a sacred gathering according to the ordinance. The ordinance to have a coming together before God to get reconnected with him and reconnected with his word so they can experience his blessing and not the decay that they had gone through for so long. So 
Chapter 8, that's one worth reading over and over and over again. So, chapter uh, 9. On the 24th day of the month, they assembled with fasting, sackcloth, and dirt upon them. Okay? That was the sacredness of the solemn assembly. And the descendants of Israel separated from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquity of their fathers. Here is corporate identification due to corporate guilt. They knew that they were in what they were going through because of past failures in their genealogy. Many of us are experiencing what we're experiencing because of things that have been passed down to us. You can't control what they did if you weren't a part of it. But what we can control is whether we continue what they did that got us into this situation. So even if you're not guilty, you know, you take the issue of race. There may not be personal racial guilt. You may not be a racist. But that does not mean there should not be corporate racial identification. You can identify with the sins of a group even though you were not personally a participant in that sin because you know that the group's sin has affected the environment in which you are living and in which you are operating and you don't want to be identified with that sin of that group even if it's your group because you want God's blessing in your life and in your world. So while they stood in their place, they read from the book, verse 3 of the law of the Lord, their God, for a fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshiped the Lord, their God. Now, could you do that? Listen to the word of God for one fourth of a day, and then another fourth of the day they're confessing. I would call this a serious, solemn assembly. I mean, these folks are not playing. This isn't the verse of the day to keep the devil away. This is desperation because of social catastrophe, social conditions, and spiritual demise. When you look at what's happening in our cities, in our communities, and in our nation, we need something radical. This is not, this is not a time for just going to church. One of the reasons God is allowing us to go through all these pandemics is he's wanting us to get serious about addressing all that we have, are facing. He's even shut down the churches from their regular scheduled programming to get us back on target with him. They cried, verse 4 says, with a loud voice to the Lord. So this is crying out. This is, this is weeping. They cover themselves with dirt, a posture of, of contrition. And uh, then they were called by the leaders, verse 5, to arise and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. After they confessed their sins, it was time to get their praise on. Why? Because they knew that when they got right with God, God was free to move in their midst. One of the reasons God is not free to move in our midst, on our personalized family life, is we won't get right with him. Now we ask him to bless us, to fix it, to change it. But no, Unless we get right with him, then he does not have the tools in order to give us what we are requesting. He needs to know we are in sync with him if we want him to change our circumstance. I know we sing God bless America. Nah, let's get it straight. America first needs to bless God. If we want God's blessing on us as a nation, as a people, if we want to fix this disunity, then we have to bless God, which means getting back to his word, chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. He rehearses. He talks about how great God is in verse 5. You're glorious. You word the blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord, verse 6. You are the Lord God, verse 7. And uh, he goes through the history of God with his people. He says in verse 19, you and your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. He fed them, he clothed them, even though they've been a rebellious people. Verse 20, you gave your good spirit to instruct them. Your manner you did not withhold from their mouth. Have you ever noticed how faithful God is even when we are faithless? 
how he provides when we break our promises to him. See, that's what a sacred assembly ought to do. It ought to remind you how things could have been if God would have turned against you. Some of us should have been dead in our grave because of what we did, how long we did it. And God still didn't walk away from you. Well, that ought to be a motivation to return to him. And not only to him, not the word God, the nomenclature God, but to the biblical standard. That's why they read the law. That's why they read the word, to get back to God's standard. See, people want God's name who don't want God's standard. He can be good for the invocation and benediction. Just keep him out of the stuff in between, okay? Well, that's what so much of our culture is like. But God is still faithful. Verse 26 says, But they became disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs. They threw the word of God out. Killed your prophets who had admonished them so that they might return to you and they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you delivered them into the hands of their oppressors who oppressed them. Their discipline, judgment for forsaking God was that the evil took over. Isn't that what we're saying in our communities? Evil is taking over. Evil viruses, evil conflict between police and community, uh, evil rebellion, evil crime. It's, it's engulfed the greatest country that's ever existed in history from the standpoint of economics, from the standpoint of inventions, from, the, you know, America has done some amazing things while it has simultaneously walked away from God. So he's allowing the oppressor to oppress us, starting with the church, because we have been so ineffective in our testimony and in our influence in the culture. And so, in spite of all that, verse 30, however, you bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the land. Nevertheless, in your great compassion, verse 31, you did not make an end of them or forsake them. You are a gracious and compassionate God. You know what you ought to pause right now and do? Thank God for his compassion. Thank God that you didn't get what your sin deserved, what your apathy demanded, but he keeps on keeping on being faithful. Well, God has not allowed us to be destroyed, but he is allowing us to be disciplined. If we don't wake up, this is a wake up call. What we're going through in our communities, it is a wake-up call. And if we don't wake up, things are going to increasingly get worse and worse and worse and worse. And so uh, he's concerned that the people not abuse the faithfulness of God and the compassion of God. Um, and so in chapter 9, he comes and he reminds them of their history of the goodness of God, even in their rebellion. Now this leads to the signing of a pledge. We make an agreement, verse 38 says, in writing and on the sealed documents of the names of the leaders, our Levites and our priests. They make an agreement. He says, if we back up to verse 36, Behold, we are slaves today, and as to the land which you gave to our fathers to eat of the fruit and bounty, behold, we are slaves in it. What ought to be a blessing became a curse. Its abundant produce is for the kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. They also rule over our bodies and over our cattle as they please. So we are in great distress. Okay, God will cause, allow create or allow the devil to create distress until we have a wake up call to get into a recovenant with him. And so chapter 10 is the signing of the pledge. All these signees, this list of names. Well, this is a significant list of names of people who are pledging 
to do things right and get things right with God. So, here's the question that I want you to address today. What have you seen of God's compassion in your life? His compassion in your family, in spite of the history, how has he still been good? And what should that invoke in your life, my life? And now what should we be doing in terms of reconnecting with him so that we can see his hand restore us in spite of our failures? How radical must we be to get back to him so that he can restore our fortunes, remove our distress, and heal our lives, heal our churches, so that through them he might heal our land. Well, where we ended last time with the beginning of chapter 10 of Nehemiah, rebuilding a broken culture, he makes a covenantal renewal. A covenant is a divinely created relational bond. They have broken covenant with God like we break covenant with God. We, 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 we bring a fissure into the relationship which allows for all manner of evil and distress to enter into that space, which means we, we need to renew our vows. That's what, when a couple renews their vows, they're recovenanting, okay? So they are recovenating, recovenating with God. That's what we need to do individually. Certainly churches need to do this. And the culture, if it wants to see God, needs to recovenant with God. Now, there were certain agreements, certain things that they had to abide by in this covenantal recommitment. For example, they had uh, disobeyed God regarding marriage, verse 30, and that we will not give our daughters to the people of the land to take their daughters for our sons. In other words, mixed spiritual marriages. God tells us in the New Testament, Christians should marry Christians. Why? So that you're on the, in the same spiritual direction. You know, a lady met a guy at the airport and he started talking to her and he asked her, where are you flying? He said, I'm, she said, I'm flying to New York. She said, where are you flying? He said, oh, well, I'm flying to Florida. He said, why don't we fly together? Well, you can't because you're headed in two different directions, okay? The idea spiritually when it comes to marriage is we're heading in the same spiritual direction. You may not be at the same spiritual level, but you're headed in the same spiritual direction. Well, that's the concern. They were marrying people headed in a totally different direction, worshiping idols who are going to draw them away from God. So that means that part of the covenant meant that the family had to function properly because he's talking about marriage. So the family had to function properly. They had to, verse 35, bring the first fruits of the ground, bring to the house, verse 36, the firstborn, the first of the herds. Verse 37, we're to bring the first of our dough, our contributions. Uh, let me tell you something. God can't be second. Certain things God can't do. He can't lie. He can't contradict his nature, but he can't be second either. He wants to know he's first. What is uh, Revelation 2 says? You've left your first love. Is God prioritized in your decision making? Not in your emotions, because emotions, you know, they go up and down. Is God first in your decisions, in your family's decisions, in your church's decisions, and in our culture's decisions? Because he can't be second. So part of the covenantal renewal was a repositioning of the prioritization of God in decision making. Because sometimes you'll have to decide against your emotions or against your desires or against your own will because you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So they have to recommit, if the covenant is going to mean anything, to realigning the order of things in how they function. Chapter 11, the leaders of the people who lived in Jerusalem, but the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while nine-tenths remain in the other cities. Okay, as you can see, a lot of the folks moved out of the neighborhood, okay, because the neighborhood was run down. Because remember where we started? The walls were down. It wasn't a secure place to live. It wasn't a profitable place to live. It was an unjust place to live. 
So what? They moved to the suburbs, okay? They left town. But now that the community was being rebuilt, they tithed a relocation program. One out of every 10 families was casting lots to move back into the neighborhood, regentrification or whatever you want to call it, to come back and help to rebuild the city. If we're going to rebuild our communities, you know, in um, segregation, when you couldn't live anywhere, there was great influence of family to family, of expertise to expertise. People could see models of what they should be. Boys could see other men. Families could see other families. Now, segregation was evil, but there was a benefit to being with people who you could see operating a certain way and give you hope and a vision of achievement. But once those separations occur, as those models were no longer there. So having a community being rebuilt and drawing people back to it, like is being done in many communities, is a positive thing. Relocation in order that there might be community renewal with God smack dab at the center. And the people blessed, verse 2, verse chapter 11, all the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. Here we go. We got the men again. The men are leading the way to revitalize the broken culture, but after they had gotten right, after they had gotten right with God. And so chapter, uh, verse 3, all the way to verse 36, recognizing people uh, who were going to be part of this rebuilding program for the culture. The Bible doesn't mind giving human recognition, okay? Giving appreciation for the people who volunteered to do that, okay? So, so that is uh, 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 what we need in our community. We need some people to relocate, but not relocate to insecurity, relocate to a place that's being built up, refurbished, or remodeled so that it's worth living in because you still have to protect your family and protect uh, 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 your community. So, chapter 12 now. In chapter 12, as we come close to the close, uh, toward the end of the book, he continues with the list. He is recognizing the people who had come to be part of this rebuilding program. What we need today are Christians who are not just interested in three people, me, myself, and I but who understand that they are part of a rebuilding process. Every church and its members should be part of a rebuilding process, whether it's rebuilding racial harmony, rebuilding broken communities, rebuilding the hopelessness of people by giving them hope, rebuilding structures that are no longer safe or, 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 or stable. The church should lead the way and be the rebuilding program. Remember, Ezra came back first to rebuild the temple. Why? Because God's presence was going to be critical to the community's ability to rebuild. But now they are involved in the process because, as we said uh, before, we are workers together with God. Verse 27, chapter, chapter 12. Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem... They sought out the Levites from all their places to bring them to Jerusalem so that they might celebrate the dedication with gladness, with hymns of thanksgiving, with songs to the accompaniment of cymbals, harps, and lyres. In other words, they got their praise on. They're dedicating the wall. When does the dedication occur? The dedication occurs after they build a wall, after they dealt with injustice, after they've had a solemn assembly to return God's word back to its primacy, in other words, they don't just have a dedication service. They have a dedication service because they got things right. They don't just, it's not just a ceremony. It involves the ceremony because they've got the symbols out there and they're, they're, they're getting their praise on, but because they have been productive spiritually, which has affected the social, legal, financial, familial environment of the people. So, uh, uh, so the people are involved in this celebration. They emphasize in verse 30, the priests and the Levites purified themselves, 
They also purified the people, the gates, and the wall. Okay, they made everything holy. And the brick and the mortar, as, as well as the people. Why? Because they wanted everything to be dedicated to God. Isn't that why we dedicate children? People dedicate their homes. People dedicate their businesses. Why, why are we dedicating uh, physical things and not just human things or human humanity? Because we want God's favor on those things. We want our homes to be safe. We want our homes to be productive. We want our businesses to work. We want God all up in it. And that's why we can dedicate communities. But those dedications don't mean anything unless they're accompanied by being purified or cleansed by his standard. Okay? So, on this day of great, great, great celebration, they offered great sacrifices. They rejoiced because God had given them great joy. Even the women and the children rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard from afar. In other words, in the suburbs, you could hear those people shouting because of what God had done in bringing about a change in their city and in their circumstances. They got their praise and took it to the next highest level. And in verse 44 to 47, you see they're putting God first. They got the temple straight. They started, people started giving what they should have been giving, that they were robbing God. They performed the worship that God deserved in verse 45. They had purification. They had the singers and the gatekeepers according to the command of David. Uh, so these folks have God back in the center and they're seeing it work out in the society, in the community, and in the culture. You know, in African American history, even in the worst of days, God was at the center. And as a result, we saw progress even without government support. In civil rights, God was at the center. So laws got changed. Whenever God is put on the periphery and he's not the centerpiece, then you're on your own. It's just what you can produce as a human being. And that means you're always going to be limited. But when God got back at the center, the culture began to be healed. The last chapter, chapter 13. They, uh, uh, they begin to, to look at how God turned a curse into a blessing. Verse 2. They went all the way back to Balaam and saw how how he was hired to curse them. However, God turned a curse into a blessing. I need to pause right there. You feel like you've been cursed? You feel like the devil's cursing you? Circumstances are cursing you? Your sins are cursing you? Your failures are cursing you? I've got good news. God turned a curse into a blessing. Do you know the Bible is full of God reversing, going in a different direction, than the negative that you were experiencing. God can take a mess and turn it into a miracle. He can take lemons and make lemonade. He can hit a bullseye with a crooked stick. He can turn a curse into a blessing. He did it in, with Balaam and he's now doing it with Israel. Uh, and, and so God can turn things around. So when verse three, they heard the law uh, they excluded all foreigners from Israel. The key to chapter 13 is the removal of spiritual compromise. Let me say that again. The key to chapter 13 is they now learn if we compromise spiritually, the blessing can become a curse again. If you want the blessing to stay a blessing and not become a curse, then you must remove spiritual compromise. One of the spiritual compromises we find in verse 4, where, where Elishab, the priest, got his relative Tobiah, and we've already seen Tobiah, <laughs> is against them, and he prepared a large room in the temple for the enemy of the Jews who were built, building the wall, he was one of the ones who threatened Nehemiah's life for rebuilding the wall. But he let his family relationship into the temple. Spiritual compromise. 
when he found out about what had been done, when Nehemiah found out about it, verse 8, it was very displeasing to me. So I threw all of Tobias' household goods out from the room. Then I gave an order that they cleanse the rooms and I returned there the utensils of the house of God with the grain offerings and frankincense. I had to put him out and I had to re-scrub the room because his contaminated life had contaminated a room in the house of God. Spiritual compromise. When you allow evil in to God's place, he knew that could turn a blessing back into a curse. And so he wanted to get rid of the spiritual compromise. He saw the financial compromise. Verse 10. I discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given them so that the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. They were supposed to support the ministry. They hadn't supported the ministry, so the ministers had to leave and go get secular jobs, go back to the fields, because they weren't being supported because the people were robbing God. And so they were financially compromising. They were, you know, they were buying their houses, driving their cars or chariots or whatever they were driving, eating their food, but robbing God. A financial compromise. But he corrects that. Verse 12, And all Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. They stopped robbing God so that their blessing would not turn into a curse. He says, Remember me, O my God, verse 14, and do not blot out my loyal deeds, which I have performed for the house of my God and its servants. When you lead the way in whatever sphere of influence you have of holding to God's standard and not compromising, then God can remember you, that is, can dispense favor on you because you're holding high to his righteous standard. Uh, and then they had compromised by... Uh, 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 compromising the, stand, the Sabbath. Verse 15 and following. What they had done was they had turned the Sabbath into a profiteering time. Remember, they weren't supposed to do that on the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath was designed to remind them that God was their source. But what they had done is called greed. They had made money an end in itself. So much so that they no longer were recognizing God as their source. So by not recognizing that, they profaned the Sabbath. You weren't supposed to do that on the Sabbath, that go after greed, go after profiteering. Why? Because you were to be reminded on the Lord's day, which was the Sabbath for Israel, that God was the one supplying you the job, the ability to work, and the income. So there should be a day where you're not trying to make a profit but where you're thanking God for the profit you made last week and what he's going to enable you to do this week. Why? Because it was the reminder, he and he alone is your source. And so, so he reminds him over and over again about the Sabbath. And then in verse 23, he talks about the fact that where they had compromised in their families. We saw this earlier Verse 23, in those days I saw that the Jews had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Okay? Illegitimate spiritual unions. Okay? They had married the enemy, meaning these women worship other gods. And they were bringing their gods into God's family house. In other words, God's standard was no longer the standard for relationships. They were creating their own standards. As for their children, so what? It showed up with the kids. Half spoke in the language of Ashdod, and none of them were able to speak the language of Judah, but the language uh, of his own people. They weren't able to communicate in God's way, God's truth because they couldn't even speak God's language. Why? Because what the foreigners brought in was more dominant than what God's people had been given. 
Families are involved in generational transfer. Our job is to transfer divine standards to the next generation. But you can't do that if they can't even speak your language. That is, they can't understand God's truth being communicated to them. You see this all the time when families don't insist that their children go to church. They get to the side where families are never given God's perspective. So what do they learn? They learn the language of the culture. So they begin to speak like their friends speak, talk like they talk at school, talk like they talk from what they're hearing on television. Why? Because they're learning the language of the culture, not the language of God. Why? Because you have an errant influence in the home, which again is why God called them to marry uh, within the faith. How big an issue was this? Verse 26, 25. So I contended, I contended with them and cursed them and struck some of them and pulled out their hair. Whew. I think Nehemiah is a little serious here, don't you? He's, because the breakdown of the spiritual foundation of the family would destroy the future of the rebuilding program. You're seeing that today. When the family is redefined or when the family is no longer transferring spiritual values, they don't speak God's language, spiritual disintegration comes in. And he made them swear by God, you shall not give your daughters, verse 25, to their sons, nor their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. In other words, this was God. That's what got Solomon, verse 26, in trouble because he married foreign women who brought foreign gods into uh, God's people and that split his whole kingdom. Verse 27, do we then hear about you that you have committed all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God by marrying foreign women? And so he goes hard against talking about the family as God described it to be. He closes with a request to be remembered. Let me ask you a question. If you met the Lord today, what would he remember you for? in terms of your spiritual impact. What could you say, or what could he say to you? I remember what you did in impacting your life, your family, your church, and your culture. I remember, and I'm gonna show you favor because I don't forget the good that you have done. Give God something to remember. As you talk, ask yourself, ask one another, is it something God can remember? Or what things do you need to do that he will remember? Because you want to help rebuild a broken culture. God bless.